Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. Today, I'm joined by Edgar and Damien, um, who are going to be talking to me about their upcoming venture with Firelock Games, Blood and Steel. Uh, but before we get into that, um, great to have you on the channel, guys. Great to be here. Absolutely. So before we get into what you're working on with Firelock, I thought it'd be nice to find out a bit about yourselves, where you come from in the gaming hobby. Uh, how did you get to this point in your lives? Go ahead, Edgar. I'll oh, start it. I guess I'll start. Um, I began gaming historical miniatures, uh, Napoleonics, with some old mimeograph rules, mm -hmm. column one and square. That's how we started uh, when I moved. I was in the service. I moved into the Jacksonville, Florida area and uh, got involved in and the painting of it, and that led me into the actual gaming and just fell in love with it, started to play a few years ago, a couple decades ago. And um, I've been playing all kinds of games ever since. Uh, my love and passion is historical miniature gaming, although I do play other non-historical games, but uh, that's what's led me to this particular stage. I actually came out from the other end. I started um, a thousand years ago back in second edition games workshop, uh, 40K. Lived in a different part of the country. It was with a gaming group there and they were painting all the little historical guys. And I was like, I'm never going to get into that gaming. Too much detail on uniforms, button counting, all that. <laughs> never going to get into it. And then uh, I moved down to Jacksonville and got with the garrison. It's a great, it's the greatest gaming group I've been with. And uh Got introduced more in the uh, in the historical realm and uh, enjoy it greatly. It's it's a lot of fun. There's there's a whole lot of um, knowledge to be gained even from just learning about different conflicts. So that's kind of where I came from. And then that brings you then, um, I suppose, into the sphere of influence of Firelock, uh, who are down there in in your neck of the woods. Was was this then a game that you wanted to write? Or was it a, a period that you wanted to explore? How did you get into it? Because Firelock, obviously, we know massively into the the pirate and the golden age of piracy. Uh, and I've started to sort of expand out slightly when Rufus and Kai did um, Blood and Valor. Uh, but, but this is opening up a whole other uh, period of gaming and style of gaming as well. Well, so we met the guys from Firelock at some of the HMGS South, uh, Historical Miniature Gaming Society South uh, conventions in Orlando mm -hmm. uh, for several years. And I, I personally got involved with Blood and Plunder, started playing it a lot, loved the mechanics. I thought it made sense. Uh, it was a game that you could get a good outcome within a couple of hours. And it was it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, then I saw what the Kai and uh, Rufus did with uh Porting that into World War One and seeing how adaptable that was, mm -hmm. um, and that got me thinking about, well, could we do the same thing about maybe Napoleonics and do something like um, Napoleonic skirmishing, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on the skirmish line, not so much the, the grand battle. Uh, so that got us thinking and, and, and putting our, our heads together about uh, doing that. Talked to Mike Tunes from Firelock about that. Mm -hmm. We decided to go slight difference into the colonial period. Uh, the age of Victoria. So he gave us free reign and everything from 1837 to 1901. And we took that ball and ran with it. Mm. Uh, so we decided to um, take on that large piece of, uh, of time with uh, one set of rule that, uh, rules, excuse me, that would fit that fairly well, especially with the development of the, of, of the te te technology, how that uh, advanced from smooth bore muskets to rifled, uh, ammunition and things, um, yeah. and um, it just grew from there. This Some guy, of it was convenient. Some of it was uh, the figures that we had, because again, sure. it was the goal was ori originally Napoleonic, and obviously we're not doing Napoleonic mm. at all. And uh, but yeah, that's uh, it, it started as convenience with the figures, but then also we have some folks from different parts of the world, and and they introduced us to some of the conflicts in that opened our eyes really to that to that period and enabled mm. us to uh, dig into that really. Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting one for me because anytime I think of it um, and, that, and that period, it always gets referred to as the colonial warfare or Victoria's Little Wars. And there's a very, if not specifically English focus, then there's certainly a very Eurocentric focus um, on the period. 
But whenever I've seen the, the front cover and, and you're looking at it just date wise, and then I, I've seen some of the pictures that were sent through and, and there's ACW in there as well. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, it overlaps perfectly with ACW and it has that change from muzzle loading muskets and rifles to breech loading and, and that development of warfare as well. And it's one that we kind of forget over here. I, I don't know if it's if it's a ge geographical thing or not, but when you think about American Civil War, you never really think of it in the same mindset as the colonial warfare in New Zealand or in Africa or in you know um, Afghanistan. It, it always seems to be slightly separated. So how does how does that play out when you're writing a rule set um, to f to actually get the mechanics of the warfare to work with the mechanics of the rules, I suppose? Well, one of the things we had to do is, first of all, figure out what our focus was going to be and, and understanding that we were not writing rules for a large battle game. We were writing rules for a skirmish game. And to further narrow that focus, we, we decided to deal with the skirmish line, <laughs> which is usually done with light infantry and things. And any missions and things that are sort of on the fringes of the larger battles. And uh, once we had that in place, then we saw that the biggest change in the time period would be, as you said, uh, the muzzle loading to breech loading, the highly, uh, fairly inaccurate to highly accurate weapons. Uh, so we made sure that uh, the stats and the uh, traits for the, the troops were in place that would take care of that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, I, if you've played Blood and Plunder, you know that after you shoot, you take a couple of reload markers. Well, in our period, people are not really taking that many reload markers because they're loading their weapons so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the period, when you're fighting with smooth war muzzle loaders, we do have a reload marker, but just a single one. It's going a little faster. By the end of the period in 1900 or 1901, everyone's basically using either a magazine fed or breech loaded weapon that doesn't require that we even have repeaters like gatling guns mm -hmm. in, into the rules that allow people to shoot even faster so it, the focus shifted from a hand-to-hand -hand combat to more of a when when we have to we have to go hand to hand we do that but for the most part it's going to be a lot more shooting sure so what we did is we took what we saw with blood and blunder and what we saw with blood and valor and we basically found that happy medium and you'll see that in the ranges, uh, the ranges to hit, the way the movement happens. Uh, you'll see a lot of, if you've played those games, this game is going to be very easy for you to pick up. But you'll also see several rules that are very specifically uh, designed for this particular time period to make sure that it goes beyond what Blood and Plunder gives you, especially with the shooting, and not quite up to what Blood and Valor will give you with that, that the accuracy levels and things are not the same. And we have a plethora of units to choose from because, as you said, we go from New Zealand uh, Maori warriors to uh, Boxer Rebellion uh, uh, folks, which won't be in the core rule, but, but mm. we have plans for that. Uh, so we have to maximize uh, the fun with all of that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think also the units, you, you were asking, I think, maybe too, about how to flavor the individual conflicts yeah. and uh, each unit may have an ability which kind of sets it apart from another one. And we also have national traits that we try to uh, give to each of the combatants in each of the periods to kind of also give a, a bit of a flavor aside from just having, you know, generic army A, generic army B trashing in the middle. So I suppose when you've got things like, um, a different rate of fire and different mechanics for reloading. Uh, it sort of helps when you've got um, native troops who move from bow and arrow to smooth bore. So they're they're always at a, a sort of a, a slight deficit behind colonial troops in the the fighting. So I suppose that helps with the the sort of asymmetric um, feeling that you would get in a lot of the the colonial conflicts um, where you've got a, a difference in technological level between the, the, the factions fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, how then do you um, deal with the, the, the core rules? Have you had to make many adjustments from the, the sort of the core of blood and valor to get, or blood and plunder rather, to get to uh, blood and steel? Or is it still relatively the same 
core ses, uh, system then would you've sort of tweaked the edges or what what are the main changes that people would see with uh, blood and steel initiative is going to be a big difference uh we don't, we don't do initiative the same way that blood and plunder or blood and valor do um ranges are obviously going to be adjusted they're kind of sandwiched in between the other two periods um Trying to think of what else we got. Um, there are some things that, um, that because we're not as much hand to hand focused. Mm -hmm. um, just to give an example, in Blood and Blunder, when a unit is uh, shaken and it's in hand to hand combat, it's engaged, yeah. um, it has to take a rally test. That's all it can do. It has to try to get away from being shaken. And we've decided, well, okay, if you're in the middle of a fight, you're not calling a timeout to try to rally yourself, you're going to fight. So there were some changes like that to, to fit better with what we were trying to do from Blood and Plunder. Mm -hmm. I would say that 85% of what you've learned from Blood and Plunder will be completely applicable to Blood and Steel. Same thing with Blood and Valor. Mm -hmm. um, there are some minor changes like the ranges, for example, Blood and Plunder uses every four inches uh, for range weapons. Uh, Blood and Valor uses every six and we go every five. Okay. So um, right that's what we're focused on is we're going right in between those two as much as possible. One question uh, that has come in um, was when you're dealing with something like this to get the feeling for something like colonial warfare, people often have ideas behind um, the tactical doctrines of nationalities. So you think of the, the thin red line and volley fire. Because you're dealing with a skirmish game, do you have to worry about things like that? Or are you not looking at that sort of, I suppose, formation within warfare? I know you said you were, you were talking about trying to play a Napoleonic game, focusing more on the light infantry. So are you not worried about the units forming into line and, and that sort of idea behind it? Or have you got ways and means of replicating that sort of uh, tactic, I suppose, um, within the game? So in our game, because you're basically dealing with a skirmish line, you, we don't have an open and closed formation. We don't have forming up into line. Um, it's actually a bit of an anachronism, and we make note of that in the rules, <laughs> that uh, at that time frame, uh, these kind of fighters would fight in groups of two to four people, in, uh, and they were mutually uh, supportive. And by virtue of what we're trying to do with a game, we have to get a little closer to what the other blood and games have done mm -hmm. and have in, in, in groups of four to eight uh, models instead of um, what was historically more accurate. But um, for the most part, we're dealing with that skirmish line. So everyone's basically in open order. Um, you do have to keep the models together for cohesion purposes. So it will look like we're having some sort of a, a formed uh, infantry type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that we could look at into future supplements that are being planned. But the focus we need to, we open it up too much and we go into larger battles, then we're talking about a different game. We yeah. would basically have to come up with some completely different mechanics. In order for the blood and mechanics to work out best, uh, we needed to keep it more as a light infantry type of, sure. of a game. And truly, there are many, 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 many rule sets that deal with uh, oh, larger battles and formation changes and things. And we play several of them. Mm -hmm. um, we were looking for something more like, uh, there's your skirmish line, there's my skirmish line, let's see who pushes the other one out. Uh, well, I suppose... Well, we're, we're discussing the rules and the like. Um, one of the big ones that I've noticed is the use of objective cards and hidden objectives, um, which is fascinating. Who came up with that? And, and do you want to tell us a bit about how this plays out for, for the two forces on the tabletop? All right. That's your baby. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my baby. So I'll go ahead and talk about it. Um, so another way to get things uh, going a little bit more, more different to add some fog of war to the game, make it a little more interesting and replayable. Even if you and I end up with the same forces uh, week after week playing the same thing, we will have the potential to play a completely different battle um, based on the objectives or the scenarios. We, we're calling them missions. Sure. So there are six missions in the core rule set that are focused on things that small bands of or skirmish line people would be doing like a raid or 
an ambush or things like that. And the design is for the players to randomly select their mission, mm -hmm. uh, whether you use a, we have a deck of cards that we've been using um, or you roll for it or there's a chit you can pull or something. And um, you both may have the same mission. You don't know it. You may have a different mission. And there are three objectives at the center line of the table. Some missions make use of the objectives. Some do not. But even if you have a mission which has nothing to do with the objectives, you have to be mindful that your opponent's mission may have something to do with the objectives. So you can't completely ne neglect them because uh, that may, may cause you to do something. Um, in Blood and Plunder, we have something called strike points, and that's how you determine who wins the game, who has the most strike points. Uh, after you have, I think, two over the other person, uh, you make a, a check, like a morale check, and see if you stay in the game. In our game, once you get to three, you're going to check. Mm -hmm. And it's possible for both armies to be checking at the same time because you're both at three attrition points. Right. And just like in Blood and Plunder, based on casualties, 25% casualties causes an attrition point. Uh, we don't call them strike points because we're not doing naval, so that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Sure. But it's basically the same thing. Um, so uh, casualties and then objectives within the mission based on units you've killed or objectives you've been able to capture or whatever also causes the opponent to have attrition points. And, and that's what triggers the end game. That or turn limit. It's fascinating. Whenever I, I watched a, a playthrough you did on the your YouTube channel, and that was one of the first things that I really drew me into the, the game was the idea that you don't know what your opponent's going for and they don't know what you're going for and you can have these feints towards a tactically worthless objective for you um, just to throw them off because then it leaves them thinking, well, is that their main line of attack or uh, maybe that's your opponent's actual main objective and, and the whole interplay of that and having to decide um, how that works. I think it was also that um, gameplay where it showed um, horse handlers, uh, so mm -hmm. mounted, mounted infantry being able to dismount and then remount again later on, which for colonial warfare, I, I absolutely love. Uh, and I assume that's part of the the idea behind a, a skirmishing force that has a, a specific objective to do. Uh, they come up, they dismount, they achieve their objective, and then they can remount and go to somewhere else on the battlefield. And it really drives home the flexibility of mounted infantry that you sometimes don't see in games they they often have as soon as you get off they're off they're gone the horses are away and and they're just another infantry unit so i really enjoyed seeing that um well if you like that you might like the fact that that cavalry could also dismount and use their horses as cover oh at which point the horses would no longer be effective for movement yeah i can imagine the be a uh, Unaffected for movement, but very good as uh, melee bags or uh, so. That was a tactic used by the U.S. cavalry against the Plain Indians uh, oh. in, in that time period. So uh, it's in the game. Oh, well, that that is, uh, yeah. Um, maybe it's just my my love of they died with their boots on and Errol Flynn. But yeah, I know I'm one hundred percent behind um, behind that. Uh, speaking about periods, it's a a broad date range, and you've already sort of mentioned that you're you're looking at other conflicts and, and battles for the future. What sort of, of um, army lists will people see? What nations and, and conflicts are, are going to be in the core rules? In the core rules, uh, we're starting off Second Seminole War. Uh, then we're going to do um, ACW, uh, American Civil War. Mexican-American. Mexican-American War. How did I forget that one? Um, also, uh, the New Zealand Wars. Hmm. and uh, Anglo-Zulu, as, as has been seen several times, and uh, Spanish-American are going to be in the core book. And what we'll show you in the core book are starting points for each one of those six conflicts. Uh, each one of them has quite a bit more that we can go a lot more in depth, uh, but we wanted this book to be something you could actually carry yeah. and uh, you could purchase and not take it, you know, not be a $120 book because there's so much stuff in it. Yeah. So um, our intent was to uh, deep do a more deeper dive um, in supplements later on. So what you see for the Anglo-Zulu War right now, it's a nice little starting point, but uh, our intent is to have a lot more depth uh, later on, for example. So that's that's interesting because um, when you're looking at the, the range and even, even seeing things like ACW in there, and you think about 
trying to fit all the the sort of conceivable lists that may have occurred during the the civil war and you think, well, that's that's a big ask at the best of times so do you think in future supplements they'll be either tied to a conflict so maybe you might expand on anglo zulu war in a whole book or will they be tied to a continent or will it just be sort of whatever takes your fancy here's the next set of of lists and and conflicts that we plan on expanding on i think you know obviously we'd want to mix some probably historical with um some flexibility because mm -hmm. not everybody is going to have everything to play maybe a particular area that you're sure. focused on but um it's quite honestly we're just starting research in the next kind of area and so it's it's really preliminary as far as trying to figure out exactly what to what to figure into the book and what to kind of just cut out but i mean it's it's literally i'm, I'm reading stuff right now so it's <laughs> he's working on his german and his friend <laughs> it's uh it's a work in progress yeah. but i mean that's the thing is trying to make sure like, like you said you can get really into the weeds on things but uh how to make it playable and how to make it digestible. That's going to be the trick. So um, everybody's probably not going to be happy, but no, well, you can never please everybody. Over. Yeah, never, never. But. And we're going to look at conflicts that are easier for, because we're not selling the models ourselves. We're not model makers. So we're not selling the models ourselves. So we have to be very mindful. What's out there? What could you, I'm not going to bring you the war of the teetotalers or something. Mm -hmm. If there are no models out there for that. So um, our focus will, well, that will be one of those uh, important aspects that we'll look into when when we decide what mm -hmm. we're going to next. And of course, um, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say the feedback from our our gamers, our players, mm -hmm. will be one of the major factors yeah. as to what we do, what we do next. I'm just I'll throw it out there just for future reference. But during the Indian mutiny, there was a Captain McCabe who should have got the VC but didn't get the VC. And I'm not saying I'm better. Well, as a McCabe, I'm better. So if you happen to if you happen to go near the Indian Mutiny War, um, then you know Captain Bernard McCabe. We saying. do have special characters in the rules right now. Some of the conflicts have some, some have them. Some of them do not right now. No. Um, but for the supplements, we definitely will have characters for each side. And so we'll have to get back with you when it comes yeah. down time to do Tw that conflict. Tw twice a soldier. That's what that's what he was. Uh, on a complete aside, and this one has been asked by a friend of the community because he's like this, have you any plans to do a Victorian sci-fi supplement using your rule set? I imagine not. It's kind of out of the scope of Firelock. Firelock tends to do historicals, but again, that doesn't, you know, I wouldn't slam the door on it, honestly. Nope. Uh, and Mike, Mike Tunez has got stuff squirreled away, so <laughs> who knows, in... in conversations with him, we may look at that. And, and obviously, depending on if this book comes out and nobody likes it, nobody buys it, then then there's not really any any reason to pursue it further. But if it if it takes off and, and then there is enough clamor for it, then, you know, why would we say no? We are absolutely aware that people are going to do some weird stuff with this, yeah. and that's fine. There will be people playing Confederates against Zulus. I know it's going to happen. So uh, in that, in under that uh, way of thinking, yeah. yeah, why not? We could probably do that. However, our focus will be on um, trying to complete the historical sure. uh, journey that we're going into. <laughs> There's a lot of ground. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm okay, pretty sure before that before making we up get Martians. there, yeah, before we get there, there will probably be some fans who would come up with their own stats and things. Yeah, and, and that, that will likely happen well before we can get there. There you go, Pete. If you want to do it, do it yourself and send the guys yeah. all the information for it. Uh, listen, if people are looking to find out more, uh, you have a Facebook group and you have a YouTube channel as well. I do. And um, this is a great time to plug it. <laughs> it's called uh, the Blood and Steel. Uh, is it called Blood and Steel Facebook group? Yeah, that's the button. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have a link for that. Uh, and then yeah. YouTube is. Blood steel. Yeah, it's Blood yep. and Steel. Blood and Steel. <laughs> Not the other. Nope. No, no, do not check Blood and Stool. You will find no. something horrendous. No, that will be interesting. No, it would not. <laughs> I don't, well, certainly not nothing you want to be looking at before lunch anyway. Uh, listen, folks, if you have any questions for the guys, 
uh, feel free to drop them below. We'll put those links below as well so you can check them out. If you're interested in colonial warfare, and this sort of neatly bridges the gap between the Napoleonics and the First World War, uh, then this is definitely one to check out for uh, an easy, accessible entry point where you're not having to worry about fielding hundreds of figures so you can uh, you can get your your feet wet, your your toes in the water for colonial warfare and ACW. Give it a whirl and see what you think about it. Uh, I absolutely love the blood and rule sets because uh, I played Plunder and Valor both. Uh, and I'm looking forward to getting my hands on the rules for Blood and Steel. And hopefully next time Mike comes over, maybe you guys can travel with and uh, we can have a game in person. If not, maybe I'll get across to Historicon in the not too distant. Or do both. Let's do both. We'll come over, you come over. Um, oh, we'll be running games at Historicon, so we'll send you a spot. There we go. That sounds fantastic. Right, folks, let me know what you think below of Blood and Steel. We're going to take a break. Bye-bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.